This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Note Closer Show. We are excited and jacked up today to have a very special guest join us. Uh, our special guest is an amazing individual. And look, some of you may know this already, but I'm going to just recap how amazing the guy has been in the past, but also what he's doing now in the future. Uh, our special guest uh, is a was once a record holder for the most amount of catches in the college football subdivision. He was a two-time All-American at the University of Oklahoma, a second-round draft pick of the Detroit Lions, and then has also played three years in the NFL. So we are honored today to have Ryan Broyles on the show today, man. So, hey, man, thanks for joining us. Hey, appreciate you having me, Matt. Hey, not a problem, man. We, we love having people on for, for one reason, too, and that's really the, the reason I reached out to you was for, for two reasons. One... You're not playing the NFL anymore, but you're very, you're a very active real estate investor. That's the the niche you chose to go into. And we were visiting a little bit before we got started, and I want to share you share some of what you're doing now. But I think what really brought a lot of things to life besides you playing the NFL was your notoriety for you and your wife, Mary Beth, who's awesome. From just what I've seen online, behind every good man is even better, more amazing. <laughs> um, your guys' ability to kind of shed and, and, and stiff arm that the high high life of the NFL, you know, and stick to a budget to really set yourself up on in, in a great place after you finished uh, uh, your NFL career. Right, Ryan. Exactly. That's, that's always been the goal. You know, I've had great mentors. Like you said, my wife as well. She's actually one to jump started these things well before I made it to the NFL. Um, but yeah, man, I just learned as much as I could. Um, and obviously try to set my family up um, as well as myself when the game was over. Right. And you, you, I think you credit a lot of it from what I've, I've seen in the past a little bit to kind of change in your mentality when you were uh, you know, new at the game, kind of new in college. Uh, you were a big fan of uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Is that correct? I really was, man. I was actually the first book that I picked up um, right before my rookie year um, in the NFL, picked up that book. Uh, well, let me just rewind where I even found that book, man. So, um I got drafted, and you hear all these crazy stories about people going broke. There was a rookie symposium that they, they hold in Canton, Ohio, um, every year just for the rookies of the team uh, or the NFL at that. Um, and one of the big stories was everyone goes broke. And so I went home, and I just hopped on Google, and people always get a good laugh at it. I just Googled, what do rich people do? Um, and so <laughs> they, were, they either invest uh, among very, various things, real estate and the stock market, and so I just dove into finding books on those. And in real estate, Rich Dad, Poor Dad popped up, man. That was the first book I picked up. I've got the notes over here um, in my little book that I always take my notes in. And whenever I get discouraged or whenever I need a, a boost, I go back to the, to the basics of that book. Yeah, it's, it's, it was one of my favorite books that I read, I think, when I turned 24, 16 years ago. There you go. Starting to read it when it, when it first came out because I'm a little bit older than you. But um, it definitely is it's mind-changing now. You you had an ACL tear and you kind of had it like I got to do something just in case yeah. it could end tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you, you uh, do you credit a lot of that to the the work ethic that your parents kind of instilled at you as an early age when you were mowing lawns and doing all that other stuff as a young kid? You said mowing lawns, funny. Yeah, my, my parents are both hard workers. Um, they showed us what it was, what it took to to be successful, what it took to overcome things. Um, and really what it took to just have hard work. So I started mowing lines, like you said, when I was eight years old. Um, I did that to fund AAU basketball trips. Um, I did that for extra donuts at the lunch line, you know. So I always knew the value of a dollar for my parents. And, you know, working was always a part of that. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, I come, my parents, hard work ethic, but they didn't really know a lot financially. I mean, a, a lot of financial education isn't taught. Uh, what and I, I I was reading a story about how you hey you didn't like a lot of kids didn't care about your bills you paid them when you got around to paying to them yeah. was that a really kind of difficult transition once you got to it or you just basically hey made it priority number one for you for the most part 
Or did you have Mary Beth well, like, yeah, was, you ain't going to go late on bills. You got to pay now. There was definitely a pushback. So when I was a senior in college, me and my um, wife, my wife now, she's my girlfriend at the time, we moved in together. Um, and obviously we were paying bills together. And she was like, hold on, Ryan, you're doing this wrong. So um, obviously my lights were turned off as a kid. I knew I didn't want those things. And my wife kind of kicked me in my butt at the time said, hey, you got to pay your cell phone bill on time. You got to pay your electric bill on time. And I was the kind of guy that was, I'll pay it last minute. Like, ah, it's no big deal. Right. Um, so then obviously I got into the NFL and I pulled my um, credit report and I had cell phone bills that weren't paid. I had all these different things. I'm like, wow, this is really important. But like, like a lot of people, we weren't taught those things growing up. Didn't know how important they were until it actually hits you in your mouth. Um, so it was a collective um, situation that actually jump started me. And once I learned what it takes to be successful financially, I just went all in. Yeah, I love it how that you basically set down the budget to to cover your bills, to pay you know twenty eight percent towards your mortgage, and you're paying. I think eight hundred. Some of the statistics, I'm sure some of those numbers have changed a little bit for yeah. you, but how you, you you paid everything, you didn't eat out a lot, you didn't party a lot. I mean, I think a lot of that comes from having a, a, a great a, a person there with you and Mary yeah. Beth being stable versus the this you know single single college kid. <laughs> yeah. Single and people player. asking that question all the time. They're like, "Would you still live this lifestyle if you were single?" And I'm like. You know, if you're single, you kind of have to be out and about and, and, and mix and vibing with people, you know. But I found my wife when I was 16 years old, you know. So we developed a relationship. And obviously, it's good to have a good time, which don't get me wrong, we still right. do. Uh, but I, it's not out there trying to show what we have so we can court a girl or what it might be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, have, have you had some of your buddies, either college or NFL or anything like that, come to you for advice seeing where you've been? And yeah, man, believe it or not, you know, I feel like every offseason since I've been done, someone contacts me um, here and there. Um, they call me about real estate deals. They call me about financial advisors, um, insurance deals, um, just to shoot the breeze, catch up, and then obviously try to figure out, um, I guess, their next step when they do get done playing. Right. Do you do you feel like you've gotten bombarded? Do you get bombarded a lot with a lot of people coming to you? Hey, I got a deal or I got something else. Uh, I, I've got some buddies that played in the NFL. A buddy, my dad, Wynn, who's a linebacker for the Cowboys for years, experienced that quite a bit. Do you, do you see you run into that yeah, still as well? Especially, especially when I was playing, there was somebody that had a big deal, a new startup. Um, and I was kind of just playing the game and just sticking to what I knew. Um, and now at this point, I'm so heavy in real estate. I love new deals. So bring them all to me now. So and I'll dissect those and take the ones that are good and the ones that aren't. But obviously, um, when I was playing my playing days and I didn't have much uh, foundation of investments, people would just ask me all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so you've made the switch to, you're into real estate aspects. So what's been what, 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 are the, what are the types of real estate deals that you like doing right now? Uh, well, I started out single family homes. Um, I kicked myself in the butt now four or five years later that I bought all of my home, most of my homes at market value. Um, I started doing onesie twosies here and there. Then I, when I got into the league, I was like, listen, I, I can get a deal, 10 houses done the same way I can get one done. So then I went to portfolio loans. Um, and for the most part, I got a, a good deal there just because I bought them in bulk. Uh, and over the last year, uh, we started going into distressed homes. Uh, so that's been my bread and butter up to this point. Uh, primarily in the Dallas market or like Norman? I mean, I'm actually, I'm in, I'm, I'm in Oklahoma right now, Norman. Um, so we just finished three homes here this year. and We just finished one out in, in Texas. Um, so just search the market, looking for our next one, man. That's awesome. And then you're, you're, you're fixing, flipping these up, turning them into rentals or just, you know, buying yeah, so them, keeping some? Initially, man, I was like, you know, when I started this flips 2017, I was like, I'm going to sell these things off. Um, then I just started started seeing my my um, my profit on those deals. Um, my spread was so much better. Um, essentially, got into every deal and got my money back when I refinanced them. So I was like, I can continue to buy these things well, fix them up better than the the rentals around the area, um, and still put my money out of it. And that I was like, at that point, I was like, I'm not selling any of them. Yeah. But I do go in thinking I'm going to sell them, uh, just depending on how it works out numbers wise. If I hit my budget, if I'm over. And I need to liquidate, then obviously that's there as well. Is there a price point that you kind of like your bread and butter, like hundred thousand dollars or less, or two hundred or less, or one to two hundred? What's your yeah? Term? Usually two hundred or less. Um, I think my it's more on the rental market that I look at uh, around uh, twelve hundred to sixteen hundred is probably the point that I like. Um, obviously, single family homes, and everyone talks about location and schools and things like that. But I usually try to stay around those numbers. 
if that's a that's a great market point there for you. We got a question. What's the question, Nicole? Yeah, Jason Bible asked, how hard was it to invest during the season? Oh, that's a good question. So Jason Bible is a, a buddy of ours out of Houston, Texas. He buys about uh, – he's actually bought about 400 homes over the last three years. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, and he asked, how hard is it to, to pull away time – from the, uh, the schedule of a busy season to, to invest? Well, initially, I did not do any during the season. I always did the work on the off season. That's when I was studying, go to classes. Uh, so most of my work was done then. Um, towards the last uh, year of my contract, um, at that point, I had teams built um, where I could go out and invest, um, kind of just give them the keys, tell them what I'm looking for, and then they'll shoot them over. And obviously, after a meeting or something, I'll check it and see what it looks like. Right. So let's let's stress that because that's important. I think a lot of uh, real estate investors, they go to a, a seminar or two hour intro session and they get all excited. Yeah. You know, they watch Flip This House or Fix and Flop or AMC TV. And yeah. we all know that's not real life for the most part. Right? <laughs> it, it really isn't. You know, obviously it feels good to watch it. You see the turnover happen in the house so quick. Uh, but once you get down to, to those um those deals where it could take a little two to a month longer than what you expected. Obviously you're looking at your budget every day. They don't show that on those shows. You know what I mean? They don't show the contractors not showing up or things like that, you know, so those all feel good. But at the end of the day, I think they do a good job of inspiring people. Um, that's essentially why I got into the game. Obviously there's times where I tell my wife, it's like, I'm not doing another one. I'm not doing another one. And then I end up doing another one, you know? <laughs> That's, that's, I think that's the story of everybody. We hit the point like, oh, I, but once you scratch that edge, you got to go back and scratch that edge. Once yeah, you get back you to go, for sure. right. Um, I like to ask the question too, is that you, what, what you, you, you mentioned you went back to school after or in the off season. Did you finish up with your degree? Well, no, your degree? I, don't, I don't mean school as in like formal school, okay. um, like some seminars, um, some business meeting classes, not where you go in and do homework, just, Go somewhere and get some education on, on your education. Okay. What it is. Yeah. Cool. Um, and for the most part, I, there's websites that I go to YouTube. It's been endless hours on YouTube books. Um, and obviously uh, you start to connect with people that are like a guy that just asked a question for your properties. Those are the people that you want to talk to. Um, you know, it might not be in everyone's game plan to have 400, but if he has 400 homes worth of experience, that's who you want to talk to. Yeah. And he started off with, with one deal and, yeah. and one deal and grew it. Um, but let's talk. He's and Jason's got a big team in Houston. We've had him on as a guest here before. Um, it's one of our top ten episodes yeah. uh, as well. But let's talk about your team because you 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 you're, you've got your fix and flips. You've also got a restaurant that you're in the process of of finishing up and, and getting things rock and rolling there at the uh, university. What is it? Uh, Oklahoma. Yeah, in Norman. But it's the the name of it is I got it right here. Yeah. I wrote it down, the, the porch, right? Yeah. At the campus corner. Let's talk about how you kind of dove into that. Is it a friendly situation, just a, a situation you couldn't turn well, down? It's funny how it happens. So I've got uh, some commercial um, brokers that I usually touch base with on my boat deals. And he was like, you know what? This is a deal that's probably something not in your wheelhouse, but I think it's worth looking at. Um, and so I hop online or I hop on the my email and it's a restaurant deal. And I'm like, ah, you know, I've heard all this crazy stuff about restaurants. And then um, I get the resume of the guy that's offering the deal. Um, I obviously saw the location. Um, and then obviously I got the, got the opportunity of talking to other big time real estate or not real estate restaurant entrepreneurs. Um, it kind of put me at ease, sent the business plan over to them as well. Um, and then I've obviously over the last six, seven months now, I've learned a lot. Um, so it kind of just fell in my lap and it was perfect timing, man. Nice, nice stuff there. So you are, uh, are you still running by your budget of the same amount? Is it adjusted a little bit since, uh, well, yeah, it's definitely adjusted. Um, and obviously at the time when I was a rookie, um, I didn't know how long I was going to play. So I, my back was against the wall there as well. Um, now that we're back home in Norman, Oklahoma, I've got a little boy that's two years old. Uh, so the budget definitely fluctuates. But over the last four years, I bought a, a lot more cash flowing properties. So that definitely helps out. And then obviously with the excess money that I have, I'm able to go back and invest. Cool. I have to ask a question and this may be offset. Do you uh, do you do anything in like self-directed IRAs or educational savings accounts right now? With oh anything? yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's that's been a staple from the very beginning. I actually invested in the stock market uh, probably about six eight months before I did anything in real estate. Um, I have a financial advisor that taught me to do those deals. So me and my wife have an IRA, SEP IRAs, and obviously our four hundred one ks. 
Um, so we continue to fund those deals. Um, so that's, that's our long-term plays and obviously trying to build some assets. So when we go to the bank and our network continues to grow and, you know, we're kind of backed by actual tangible assets that definitely helps us out. That's, that's phenomenal. Any, uh, you start with rich dad, poor dad, and you're a very avid educator videos, YouTube, going to different self-education seminars. What's a book that you're reading or listening to right now? You know what, to believe it or not, um, I told myself in 2017, less is more. Um, so I'm actually doing more personal development stuff. I'm reading a book right now that I can't really remember the name. Actually, it's, it's called Ageless Memory. It's sitting right here. Um, and it's just talking about our, our brains and how to memorize things. So that's where I am right now. Um, I've got a good knack at um, understanding properties. So when I see them, I don't feel like I'm at, at base zero anymore. Um, so I wouldn't say I, I really dive in on those deals like I'm a newbie. Uh, but yeah, it's more personal development right now, man. That's good. I think that's a, it's a, a really good, smart thing to have because I think we got the best asset we have is ourselves and that hurdle between those two. Know, you gotta work it. You gotta work it. <laughs> Um, with you guys doing the real estate, do you, how do you and your wife kind of balance a lot of that, that relationship? You're both very gung ho about the real estate side. She managed specific aspects, aspects of it that you don't touch. You work to your strengths. How's that kind of balance out for you? Uh, well, we, we definitely, we definitely bounce things off of each other. Uh, my wife can really, she has better instincts than I do. So if we drive by a property and she's like, you know what? I don't really feel that. And I look at the numbers and I like it. I usually go with what she says. Um, at the end of the day. And so where she's really stepped up um, that's been very vital is on our, our rehabs. She's got the, she's got the eye to, to know what needs to go here and the material to pick out. So over this past year, she's definitely helped out there. I'm not a guy that wants to dissect five different looks, um, you know? So my wife's going to, Hey, this is the look, let's go with it. I'm like, all right, it's all yours. You know, and I just kind of <laughs> the, the contractors at that point. Give me the numbers. You can handle the inside. Just give me the numbers, right? You must have a job for sure. That's awesome. That's that's a good thing. And going back, you got a young one right now. Stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Just woke up too. Yeah. Just woke up. That's fine. Hey, we, we got kids that run wild. We had dogs, animals that run wild in different interviews and stuff like that. What is what are some of the things that you're going to instill in, in him at, at a at an age that maybe you didn't learn early? Have you guys given any thought to that? Discuss that. Well, you know what we, I guess on the finance side, my, my parents, they were never too open about bills and credit scores and things like that and, and how much they made. Um, all we just saw is them work. So I think when Sebastian gets to his age, you know, I'm going to say, hey, this is why daddy's sitting on his computer doing this. This is, this is what we're trying to build. This is what we're trying to do. Um, so just really just talking about it a little bit more than what I got growing up. Um, obviously, in this day and age, you know, it's taboo to, to talk finances and especially to your kid. Um, but I think that's something that I'm going to be able to instill in my little guy uh, from the very beginning. And this is there he is. <laughs> say hi. Can you say, can you say hi? Hi, Sebastian. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Can you do this? Hook them horns. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He said, he said, he said, <laughs> oh, you know, shy. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. So, you guys also uh, have a passion for traveling in, with what you do, right? You guys travel the world and stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's been um, the very the very the very biggest thing that we've ever done. Um, I can't say the biggest thing, but the most beneficial. Uh, we definitely want to be culture. Growing up here in Oklahoma, um, it's, where it's a tight-knit place and not a lot of people leave here, um, especially Norman. Um, so when we got the opportunity to leave, we definitely do that. So when I signed my contract um, back in 2012, we were like, listen, we're going to go see the world. So um, a month after I got drafted, we went to China, uh, went to, to Hong Kong and just about every year and more frequently now that I'm not playing, we definitely try to go see places to be cultured. Um, and actually it's funny you say that because we're, we're about to learn Spanish and we're going to move over to, to Spain for about six months um, at the beginning of the year. So it's just about being in different places and stretching our minds. Um, Cause obviously there's a lot more to life than just living in your, in your shelter, you know? Yeah, and the fact that you have a good team surrounding you allows you to be able to still live a life. Versus, yeah, yeah. and that's that's been most beneficial, man. Just financial freedom um, is always our goal. Um, we actually just started a property management company, and we're in the point of we're vetting out people to to run those deals while we're gone as well. 
Um, so we're, we're just trying to build these assets so we can go out and continue to, to live the life that we want to live. And, and not only that, share it with people, you know. Let's talk a little about that. What's your what's your future plans? Because I know you have a, a passion for sharing that. Have you uh, gone back and, and spoken with new new guys in the NFL or at the at uh, OU as well, trying to help guide uh, give guidance to those guys? Yeah. Well, I I'm probably making a speech twice a month nowadays, um, whether it's uh, real estate or just um, personal development. Uh, so it's obviously been in a position that I've been in. Uh, being able to to come back home and speak to kids and uh, low low income families, um, even kids that have aspirations to make into the league, um, kids that don't get to go see the world. Uh, so really, wherever it's where I'm asked, I rarely turn out an opportunity to speak. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in a position that I am, and my wife are. Uh, and it would be a, it would be a huge sin for us not to go give back and, and show that. You know, if you do things um, in the right manner, you'll be able to help other people out. And so I feel like that's where we are in life right now. That's a, that's a, that's a great, great message to have and a great drive to, to help overcome things. I think it's a lot of the most successful people in the world are the most giving and the most approachable, too, because they have big hearts and they've been down the, the, the low streets and to pull themselves out of there, too. Yeah. Are you, um, I, I think you, earlier on in your budget, you guys plan and always putting at least 10 percent away at your budget towards your savings in, in your retirement. Are you, if you're still doing that or putting more of that now with the, the real estate stuff being more successful and that stuff? Well, I think at, at this point now, we want to make sure we have a good enough cash reserves, um, obviously for, for the rental rehabs and things like that. And the people that don't pay their rent when they're supposed to pay their rent. Um, but yeah, we're, we're to the point now where we just, any excess cash that we have, um, we like to travel. Um, and then obviously we're going to throw it back into some more investments um, and, and try to be as sound as we can there. Uh, but yeah, we like to have a cash cushion where if all else fails and everything burns down, we can still make it. <laughs> That's a great, great philosophy. So few people have that aspect of whether it's, uh, you know, learn it from Susie Orman or Dave Ramsey or, 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 you know, Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad, there's specific things that are easy to do. It's just a matter of making them a priority out there you know what i mean without a doubt and i think uh, you hear a lot about lifestyle inflation um that's something that we try not to fall into granted it's hard when you get a deal done and you're like wow this is going to bring in x amount of money um my first thought like it's been from the very beginning is let's go buy another asset uh we're we're perfectly fine where we are uh, and i think that's why a lot of people were amazed when i made when we made it to the nfl that wow this guy lives off 60 grand a year it's like well I lived my whole life off 18 with my family. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm living the dream right now, to be honest. And we're going to keep, try to keep that, that mentality. Um, and, and just like I said, being culture, going to other places, seeing how here in America, we've got the most opportunity out of any country in this world. Um, just, we don't need much, you know, we've been down to Haiti a few times and, and I'll tell you, those are the happiest people in the world and they have nothing. So I'm like, God, oh, there's no way that I need to go out here and, not saying I don't want to make a million a year, but hey, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm good at living at this range. I don't need to go out here and buy all these, these depreciating um, liabilities and things like that. So we're, we're pretty comfortable where we are. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. And you mentioned Haiti, we've got a, a buddy of ours, Scott Dilly, who actually funds a, uh, an orphanage in Haiti for about 20 plus kids out yeah. of his own pocket every year, out of his own real estate deals. Yeah. And, yeah. And his, tremendous job takes people down there every year and that's i think it's one, one thing it's you, you, you find is you like to give back so besides hades or any other um charities or things that you guys contribute to on a regular basis or, or yeah, actually, i started a foundation um in 2012 it's not active now but um it was the ryan bros foundation we helped underprivileged families um i dressed up as santa over the years uh, giving kids um presents here and there we did thanksgiving giveaways um, it's really centered towards people like me when I grew up. You know, we didn't have much. You know, we went to lived in homeless shelters, lived in motels. And that's where I want to inspire the most. You know, not to say that other people don't need to be inspired, but those are the people I feel like that are assisting neglected, if you want to say. So those are the places that we want to give back the most. But, but we give back to the church. We give back to um, my wife's a big advocate for animals. Um, so we give back to the animals. Um, Dog well. or cats or both. Any animal. There we go. All right, all right, good. All right. It's on the road. My wife's ready to cry. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we've got somebody that's very, yeah. <laughs> yeah and I'll tell you, it was funny. So I'm on Facebook and I find my Chris Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I've got all these various um, financial deals and the news. And I look at my wife's timeline and it's animal this, animal that, you know, <laughs> it's just kind of funny. <laughs> Hey, nothing wrong. She's the yin to your yang, brother, right? <laughs> now, have you, uh, and I don't know this, and if, if it's not, just tell me, is there uh, other people that you've networked with, the ex-players like Ward Dunn or anybody like that who's doing, you know, fix and flips and rehabs and things like that and network with them? Or um, No, I haven't. Not any, you know, not any ex-athletes. It's really just local business partners that I've had. Um, just connecting with people around the United States that do that. Um, I'm on bigger pockets often, so I get to associate with people on there. Uh, but not not anybody of an NFL stature. Now, granted, if they come along, I'd be happy to do that <laughs> and, and shoot the grades with them, um, but not at this point. Yeah, or anything. I know that a uh, couple Cowboys, you know, Emmett Smith and uh, Roger Starbuck are big. In the yeah. real estate community there you in Dallas. It's funny, Roger Staubach, they actually connected with me a couple of years ago, and I know they have some big platform that they have going where they offer a certain percentage, and I'm too hands-on for that, man. Uh, so I, I still actually have it on, on one of my folders here, and I always look back to how they present those deals, and I kind of mimic some of the deals when I, when I send it out to potential investors. I kind of do the same thing. So let's talk about that because that's a. I think a lot of people. You you've come from a spot, didn't have any money. You got money. You've got your own money to do some things with, which is great. Yeah. But you are still to do bigger things. You're reaching out and raising capital from other investors and business owners, correct? Oh, for sure. So they they said the name of the game is OPM, other people's money. Um, now, granted, when I was, <laughs> I can promise everybody, I did not prep him for that. Cause we <laughs> that all the time. So that's great. Yeah, well, that's the truth. And it, and it makes perfect sense. Cause there's, there's power in numbers and you only have so much to go around. Um, and like I said, in, in, in my game plan, we, we want to make sure that we have, um, a significant amount of cash on the side. Um, and so for our backs against the wall, we need other people, you know, and I, I might be the one that brings expertise and puts the deal together and, some people might come to the table with the cash and vice versa. So it's always good to, to be able to find excess money um, so you can grow with those people. And hopefully as those things perform, you can, you can roll those into others. Right. And when you talk about presenting, you are talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, you're emailing out to your database. What are some of the things that you're doing uh, uh, for your deals? Well, 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 when it first started, it was just people that I knew. You know, and, and those are the people I feel like it's the hardest to break through on, you know, because they, they know who I was when I was a knucklehead at 16, you know what I mean? So they're like, oh, he doesn't know, you know, but um, usually social media is really the biggest thing. I know there's laws against trying to solicit um, some people on there, but there's ways around it, I believe. And um, that's been one of the bigger ways that I've been able to connect with people that aren't just in my backyard. Um, but then there are people that just find my number. They find my email, my website. Um, and they connect and we, we go from there. That's awesome. Because we had a lot of, that's always seems to be the biggest fear of somebody coming out of a regular job is asking for funds or asking for money. Yeah. And we're a big believer. Hey, if the deal makes sense, if yeah. it's good, you'll find the money for it. Well, I'll tell you, I, I felt the same way because I didn't want to be a guy like with my hand out, but people, people want to be successful. People want to, to get in the game. And if you ask anybody what they want to invest in, it's going to be one or two things. It's going to be they want to, they want to fund the retirement, whether it's the stock market, um, or they want to buy real estate, you know? So if you, if you bring a game plan together um, and you just tell the story instead of actually the dollars, then I think that's where it really starts to pay off. And leveraging that the fact that you've got a team behind you as well versus that you're not going to be the guy doing everything too, right? Yeah. And granted, when you start out, you might not have that team. But I'm definitely to the point where um, me and my wife can go on vacation and things are still going to float. Uh, if something does happen to come up, uh, we've got that taken care of. And there's people that I'm actually trying to find somebody now that can take over some of my emails uh, where they can actually vet the property before I have to look at it, you know? So I want to get to that point where I can do less is more. Uh, I was just reading a book called Extreme Retirement um, and it talks about a Renaissance man. And they said it's, it's better to do 10 things at 10% than one thing at a hundred. Um, now granted that's taboo to what people believe now, but uh, I think that's where I am in my business. You want to delegate as much as you can, obviously not to stretch yourself thin, but, 
Um, you want to work um, on your business and not in it. Um, I've heard that a million times and it's starting to make sense for me. There you go. What would you say has been the most influential besides reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, what's been the, uh, another monumental moment in your life that kind of changed y- your path? Man, I went deep, I went deep there. Say, because I feel like everything that I read now, it all goes back to what Robert Kiyosaki was first preaching, man. I feel like I've read some most, many books, read many articles, and they kind of touch base on the same things. And that's what I tell people all the time. is like, listen, once you read this book and you pick up anything else, you're going to start to understand. There's four or five points of what people, people say. Uh, when it comes to finance and especially in real estate, you know, you, you make money when you buy, um, don't over leverage yourself, obviously have a, a, a firm foundation. Um, these are the things to look for. If you're doing distressed homes, these are the things to look for when it comes to um, good breaks to the bank, just how to connect with these people. So I'm almost to the point where I've read so much. Um, I just stick to the basics and I, and I kind of feel when things are good. Now I do want to take my game to the next level and, be able to understand things outside of my region, um, really look at the economy and figure out, hey, this is where the jobs are going. This is where um, where the better tax laws or this is where rates are. And I want to be able to maneuver with the big dogs at some point. That's great. Because I was going to ask you, if you have any, if you and Mary Beth have set one year, you know, five year, 12 year, 10 year goals or anything like that as well or no? Oh, uh, well, first thing when I came out, I was like, listen, when I'm done playing this game, I want to have financial freedom. Um, and so before I retired, um, we matched that goal. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, obviously I want to have a good, strong marriage. Um, I want my son to be well taken care of. Um, and I want to just keep a level head and, and help people out, you know, at the end of the day. And then, like you said earlier, travel the world, man, that's been our biggest goal. Um, and, and I tell my friends all the time, I was like, listen, I, when I try to talk to them about real estate or just investing in general, because a lot of people are, are they're scared, they're nervous. And I'm like, listen, I just want to sit pina coladas on the beach, you know? So that's, that's my why. Um, I guess those are my whys. <laughs> but yeah, obviously, um, you know, I just want to, I don't want to get too big um, where I can't go on vacation, but I, I still want to grow and, and take advantage of um, the markets that are turning. Um, obviously I started investing in 2012 and we've been in the up market since then. Um, I've talked to some, some of my mentors where they talked about in the late eighties where rates were crazy and the world seemed like it was falling apart. Then I haven't been, I haven't been there yet. So, um, there's going to be some point where I've got to learn those deals. Obviously it's not going to go up forever. Um, so I'm, I'm still an infant when it comes to investing in real estate. Obviously I've learned a lot up to this point. Um, and I'm going to continue to learn when things start to slide the other way. We'll make sure and send you some information on becoming a note investor. That makes when the market crashes That's like that, more and more opportunity, which is good. Yes, for sure. With that, and on the distress side too, is what I've heard. So, well, I'm I'm excited for that. Um, now, granted, I don't want people kicked out of their houses, uh, but if you find a solution and you do what the government essentially needs you to do, then obviously you get rewarded for being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, that's that's the I think it's one of the most rewarding things that we do on the debt side is when we're able to modify or reinstate a borrower. I mean, we just we bought uh, 70 assets for the last 90 days and we've gotten 50 of them to basically reperform, reinstate. And yeah, you know, the, the, the borrowers are happy to stay in the house and things like that. And it's, it's a yeah. win win. And that's that's what you ultimately want. Without a doubt. Yeah. Unless you're playing football, then you want to be the only one on the winning side of the game. <laughs> With the, yeah, very true. We always want to win. If there's a winner, there's a loser for sure. <laughs> Um, were you surprised at Stoops stepping down uh, a few months ago? I think everybody in the state, I think everybody in America, if you're a OU fan, you, you were surprised. Um, now, granted, people said he should have stepped down many years ago. Um, I think it's the best time for him. He came off of a big win. Um, if he would have did it after the season, I don't think people would have been as surprised. But he went through the, the off season. He went through the spring. Um, and then he steps down. It's a bit of a surprise for sure. I got a little teary eye when I heard about it. Um, I shot him a message and was like, hey, coach, I love you. And he said he loved me too, man. So that was that was definitely good to see, man. You know what? I will tell you this. Being a UT fan and, and, and hook him horns, um, <laughs> yeah. it, it was like, what? You know, yeah. and so I guess the first time in forever that both UT and OU have rookie head coaches. So it's going to make the Red River rivalry very different here in, in, yeah. in the next week or so. But um, definitely excited. We had any more questions from people, comments on stuff? A lot of people are liking it. It's great stuff. I don't want to take too much of your time because I know you've got a very busy schedule, Ryan. If there's a uh, one thing that you could leave as a quote or leave out there for people that are looking to dive in, what would that be? 
to dive into real estate? Yes, sir. Dive in. You got to go. You know, obviously, you don't know what you don't know. Um, you're, you're not going to be a pro from the very beginning. Um, so really, just to keep it as simple as possible, dive in, learn. Um, there's going to be mistakes and just try not to repeat those deals. And you just continue to stack those wins on top of each other um, and try and then you'll learn to avoid the ones that the bad mistakes that you didn't make. Do you have a deal that didn't do well that you learned from? Yeah, well, my first flip that I did, or I guess my second, my first flip that I ever did was in 2012, and that was it's a home run success, and that was really what catapulted me to go and to buy more properties. But um, I bought a home in November of 2016, a uh, distressed home. First, I went to the, um, the courthouse steps for about two months looking for a deal, drove hundreds of properties. One came up. I was like, okay, this is around the corner from my house. This is one I want. It was in shambles. It was a forest. It was in a neighborhood. I didn't really know how to, to even figure out what things are going to cost. You know, I know I knew we needed a new roof. I knew we needed to, to move trees and things like that. Um, obviously, you don't get to go inside. I'm knocking the door, no one answered. Look through the window. I'm like, oh, it's not that bad. This deal is going to cost about thirty grand to fix up. Well, find out. I get in there and it cost me sixty. Um, but I still came out on top. Um, it, it's a beautiful home now. Um, rents are in a good spot. Um, but I, I, I feel like I, I dropped the ball there, but it was definitely a learning process. Um, so I bought another house a month after that. That's actually been my best deal to date, just because I felt like I faltered on the first one. I did refinance that deal and got most of my money back. So it, was, it wasn't a loss, um, but it wasn't as good as I thought it would be. The second house I did, I got all my money back. Um, and so I've been off and running since then. <laughs> No bad deals. We want to make sure it make it ha that happen there for you. So, there you go, sir. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today on the Note Closer Show podcast. Thank your wife as well, because I know she's in the background uh, taking care of Sebastian and, and yeah. making sure everything's good and, and for you know, kind of setting this up initially when I reached out to her. So big thanks to her. Uh, sure. uh, guys, once again, you can uh, – Learn a lot from people who have been successful, but are also brand new to something else. If you hear what Ryan talked about, using other people's money, diving in, using a team, these are all basic, really the, the, the big commandments of real estate investing, I would say. Don't be I, I, I will say one thing, though. It's a, you can read multiple articles, and it seems so simple, and you're like, there's no way it's this simple. But once you get going, it's it's pretty simple. Um, once you once you find the right property and you get in at the right price, it, it's fairly simple at that point. Because at the end of the day, um, if you do the you do your numbers right, it is what it is. You know, it's not gonna just not gonna wake up one day and be something else. Right. If you wait around, that deal will eventually be gone if you don't pull the Somebody trigger. Somebody else will get it for sure. Good stuff. Well, hey Ryan, thank you so much for joining us again. You guys right. have a great day. Uh, and stay out of trouble, all right? Yeah. Keep knocking it out, and we'll be in touch with some other great info for you, all right? We'll do, man. Hey, and Boomer Sooner. Boomer Sooner. <laughs> 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 we'll see you later.